Welcome to Into the Night. I'm Nari, your guide on today's excursion down a twisted path. Be careful not to get lost. Be it dark or light, it's easy to lose your way. Are you ready? Then let's begin. The Trophy Hunter My family has hunted for generations. It's who we are. Some don't understand the need to hunt, especially when the end game is a nice head mount for the wall. And not everyone hunts out of the necessity to eat. We hunters have heard every argument against what we do, but we haven't let the naysayers deter us. It's our heritage, and hunting serves a role in the ecosystem. Any conservation agent will tell you that the money earned through license sales and special hunt permits is used to help the greater population of species. Selectively thinning the herd keeps any number of problems from becoming ecological disasters. It's also a thrill I can't get any other way. That last fact explains why I hunt the apex predators in an environment. Sure, anyone can shoot easy prey. Not everyone can go head to head with another natural born killer and win. Nothing matches the excitement of watching an animal that wants to kill you submit to your will as you snuff out its life. I realize not everyone who hears about my hunts will agree with me or even like me. I don't care if I'm liked. I have friends and family and no one else takes up space in my life or my head. I'm not talking about my adventures to impress those who hate the idea of hunting. I'm talking to the ones who do get it. You know if you have the hunter's spirit coursing through you, and that's who I gravitate toward. Now, on to my reason for telling you this. For my most recent safari, I went to one of my favorite spots on Earth. I found an abundance of game there but I made the trip with certain predators in mind. I always tell new hunters to study their quarry before stepping foot on a hunt. Find out how the animal thinks, what motivates it, where does it like to hide, and where does it feel comfortable. The latter is important because a relaxed animal isn't on guard and is easier to sneak up on. When dealing with a dangerous animal, you always want to give yourself as many advantages as you can. If you know what makes your prey tick, you have the upper hand in most cases. On my first day on the trail, I almost had a beauty, but something spooked him. It happens, and while disappointing, I couldn't let one failure distract me or mess with my concentration. I knew where he hung out, and all I needed was patience. At some point, he'd make a mistake. It took until the third day of tracking him, but he finally did make that mistake. It was a perfect kill. For a second, he froze, as though he sensed something was up, but I remained patient, controlled my breathing, and eventually, he relaxed and went back to eating. By the time I was close enough to strike, it was too late for him to run. I hadn't bagged one this nice in a long time. He was the epitome of what a hunter looks for. Once I get home, I'll post photos of him after the kill so you can have a sense of how big he was compared to me. As impressed as I was with him, I was relieved I hunted for a trophy and not meat because it would have been hard to pack him out. Instead, I cut off his head and cape, stored them, and went on my way. Next, I traveled hundreds of miles for a chance of another of the big three game prizes. The terrain was tricky, and since my prey was primarily nocturnal, it made the pursuit that much more difficult. He'd recently finished a kill of his own, and he felt lazy and satisfied. I watched the ease with which he killed, and while horrified at the sheer brutality, part of me recognized the skill it took for him to succeed. This particular specimen was an adept killer. Never 
And I mean never let your guard down. I admit my nerves and excitement got the best of me and I was sloppy. Before I knew it, I was the hunted and he was upon me. I didn't have time to think. It was kill or be killed. And for a few moments, I wasn't sure who would come out the winner. He knocked my weapon of choice to the ground when he first sprang upon me. So I resorted to up close combat with my blade. Obviously I won. I managed to salvage enough of him to make a nice mount, but my taxidermist may demand extra because he has his work cut out for him. <laughs> no pun intended. I spent so much time pursuing that second kill that I almost ran out of time to take down the third of my desired animals. Yes, I had two amazing trophies already, but something was missing if I went home without the trifecta that my heart was set on. Hunters and non-hunters can relate to the disappointment felt when your long-awaited trip falls short of your expectations. I didn't want that to happen. The clock kept ticking, and I knew I had to make use of every second if I was going to return home happy. While stalking my last kill, I experienced a feeling that many may not believe a hardened hunter like myself would be capable of. Contrary to what some might think, I am soft-hearted about a good many things. Yes, I kill for fun. But have you ever watched a nature show in which a predator kills another animal? Have you ever wanted the cameraman to put down the damn camera and save the innocent young or the defenseless prey from certain destruction? I have. That's why I only hunt predators. I will only take on an animal that is on equal footing with me. We are peers, and he could kill me as certainly as I can kill him. I detest the predation of innocence, and I will fight to defend them whenever possible. I'm not a saint by any means, but I have a heart, and I have a personal code of conduct that I live by. It may or may not make sense to you, but it's true. The reason why I tell you this is that my ethics caused me to cast my safety aside. I could have allowed my third trophy to distract himself while he attacked an innocent, and I could have struck him at that moment and then walked away with my prize. I couldn't stand by, however, and watch him brutalize another life. So I placed myself between my prey and his prey. The shock on his face was intense, but his hunger to kill me replaced his confusion. He bared his teeth and maneuvered to find a weakness in me. We tangled, then separated, and circled each other time after time. The violent dance took place for over an hour, both of us exhausted, and I barely missed a move on his part that would certainly have led to my death. Then I saw an opening, and I took it. This kill was special, satisfying. I killed not only to save myself, but to spare others. I relished watching the life drain from his eyes as I dug my blade deeper and deeper into him. Now my safari is over, however. I'll head home with my trophies as well as satisfaction. I fulfilled my hunting dream and I rid the earth of three top predators, a serial killer, a terrorist, and a rapist. On my flight back home to my planet, I'll toast my success. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Into the Night Anthology Podcast, written by Caroline Giamanco, narrated by Nari Kwok, theme music by Nico Rodriguez, all other original music, sound design, and editing by Omen Hawk Studios. You can find our links in the show notes. Into the Night is on your favorite podcatcher, so make sure to like, subscribe, and leave a five-star review to help other excursionists to join us. I'll see you next time, and remember, whether in the shadows or in the daylight, 
All twisted paths lead you into the night. Into the Night Anthology is a Creative Typo Entertainment production. Microphones and Monsters is a Cthulhu D&D actual play with a balance of horror, mystery, and comedy. Our story begins in a 1920s Magitech noir setting. We follow the story of Alistair. That power is very much something that I need, and I don't want that to stop. Victor. I don't think I want to help you. And Julian. It's burning. What happened here can't see the light of day. As they come face to face with Eldritch Horrors. <laughs> I don't think you could ever stop me. And try not to fall into madness. Go to microphonesandmonsters.com or listen wherever podcasts are found.